Thank you for joining us on Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Will Yeomans. With us today is Bashara Dumani, Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley. He's also a member of the editorial committee of the Journal of Palestine Studies. Professor Dumani just returned from a trip to Palestine. He'll be talking about uh, his trip and what observations he made while there. Thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Happy to speak with you. So how long were you over there? Uh, just a week and a half, 10 days, a quick trip. But I went to a lot of places, spent some time in Nazareth, in Haifa, in Jerusalem, and Ramallah, and Nablus, and Jericho. Did anything strike you as being different than on previous trips in terms of the mood of the people? Well, it's hard to tell on a worldwide a whirlwind trip like this one, but uh, uh, a little bit more uh, worry, a little bit more uh, concern about the paralysis and the political situation. Uh, paralysis doesn't mean stasis. So people feel that the political situation is not moving forward, but at the same time they feel a great deal of vulnerability for what or insecurity about what might happen. Uh, specifically, what, what are the biggest areas of concern that you're, you or people kind of discussing? In terms of daily life, people are living from um, paycheck to paycheck or handout to handout. I think that's the crux of the matter. Meanwhile, the cost of living is going up, the cost of land is going up. You walk around the streets and you see tremendous economic activity and that creates a kind of a dissonance. How can you have such a dynamic economic situation along with a paralyzed uh, political one? It seems as if the private sector and people's daily buying and selling of things is not in tandem with what's happening uh, politically. Are people talking about the factional uh, differences? Is there much hope being held out for the possibility of reconciliation? My, my sense is that within a few years of Oslo, in other words, 10 or 15 years ago, most Palestinians stopped paying too much attention to the formal political level of, of, of Hamas, Fatah, uh, negotiations, etc. They, they saw through that stuff, and uh, they're much more concerned about other issues. Um, so, um, the kind of factional mobilization uh, that characterized my generation, for example, which everybody was expected to be at least sympathized, if not be a member of a particular political party or not, is not the situation that prevails now, especially among the youth. And so, uh, this is not the level at which people talk. Nevertheless, uh, they do pay attention to whether Fatah or Hamas or the Palestinian Authority are talking to each other or not and what the issues are, because in the end, uh, what they agree on will affect them. And in that sense, uh, I think everybody's clear that I've talked to that uh, they want a united Palestinian body politic, but uh, everybody I talk to has no hope that this will happen anytime soon, if at all. Speaking of uh, hope, and that might be the wrong word to use, what, what are some of the possibilities for breaking the impasse that could be coming down the line in 2012? Well, hope, such as it is, um, probably comes from uh, the Palestinians uh, organizing on a local level uh, and pressuring their leaderships and on the, from the changes that are happening outside of Palestine, especially <clears throat> the uh, Arab uh, uprisings in Egypt, Tunis, and elsewhere, I've set an example, which have uh, created uh, a new a break in the kind of uh, political structure that was there before, where you had Egypt, Jordan on the one side uh, um, allied with the Palestinian Authority, and you had Syria, Iran on the other side, and they seem to be stuck. <clears throat> now there's room for movement. We see that uh, reflecting itself in the way that Hamas is trying to reposition itself. It accepted to join the PLO. Uh, they're putting some feelers out there in terms of uh, um, maybe um, changing uh, their, their policies, etc. Uh, we see it in uh, the way that the Palestinian leadership uh, tried to get uh, a United Nations to accept Palestine <coughs> as a member. Uh, we see it in, in a number of, of different ways. There is a kind of a shakeup of the political situation going on, which, which may yield something. Mm -hmm. Now, on your trip, I know you went to Nazareth, and that was your first time being back there in a while. Uh, 
Uh, did you feel like there was a continuity at all in terms of what people were thinking about and talking about, or or is the Palestinian reality so fragmented uh, that it was like stepping into a different world? This is, of course, a perennial issue and a perennial problem. Uh, Israel has been very successful in creating a, a number of bubbles or compartments in which Palestinians... Uh, are so pressured and, and feel so overwhelmed that uh, daily survival requires a really narrow focus on on a small on the world within that bubble, and very few chances of crossing or popping these bubbles and connecting with each other. So uh, Nazareth, in many ways, uh, people are talking about the New York Times article uh, that had sort of fancy new Nazareth nouveau cuisine. <laughs> Nouveau Cuisine uh, as being attractive. Uh, they're busy pouring money into old houses, turning them into restaurants. Uh, people talking about Nazareth becoming a cultural capital in one way or another through a number of initiatives on music level or uh, other cultural levels. And uh, you wonder, uh, do they understand that there's other parts that exist outside of that Galilee region, especially with the huge tensions and problems in the South, uh, in the Negev, uh, which they seem to be oblivious to. At the same time, uh, you go to Nablus, and everything is hopping and popping. Uh, there's new restaurants and new cafes. Uh, there's a, a kind of a culture for the young that you haven't seen or maybe imagined 10 years ago, and that's because Nablus was choked uh, under siege, a little bit like Gaza, by the Israel, and then they opened up and... Uh, things started uh, hopping again. Uh, <clears throat> you go to Jerusalem, they feel completely isolated and betrayed. They feel that they are completely unique. Uh, the, the, the pressure at stripping them of their citizenship, the economic disaster that they've been living through, um, <clears throat> the complete isolation from others is, is created kind of a Jerusalem bubble as well. Not, not to mention what's happening in Gaza or Hebron or elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> so national structures, and as much as they exist, of the Palestinian Authority are not enough to connect people to each other. The way people connect is, is again, on the daily life level. Uh, people from Nazareth and the Galilee descend on Nablus now in large numbers uh, through organized bus tours and so on. Uh, there's hardly anybody who owns a car in Nazareth that doesn't come and fix it in Nablus or Janine because it's so much cheaper to do it there or to buy vegetables or some other things. And so they're reconnecting that way. Uh, labor market, uh, <clears throat> the ability of Palestinians to work inside of Israel is much easier in the north through the Janine to kind of Kalkilia area where there are villages like Bakal Garbi and Baka Shaki which are split in half and people know each other. Uh, whereas movement uh, from Gaza or Hebron is much more difficult into Israel. So uh, there are not just different artificially created Israeli legal bubbles, but uh, there are local political economies uh, that uh, both reinforce these bubbles and break through them uh, depending on the region in the region that you're, that you're in. How do these patterns of interaction and movement pertain to uh, politics at all? Well, this is the Sixty-four thousand dollars. That's the old days. Maybe sixty-four million dollar question. That's, that's nothing uh, these days, you know. <laughs> or a sixty-four billion dollar question these days. Uh, so the language of politics itself is changing. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a political vocabulary that we're all used to, and that we read in the New York Times or <clears throat> in the United Nations. That's not the vocabulary most people use when they discuss our situation. Uh, so there's developments on the ground in terms of uh, popular struggle in particular areas, certain movements such as BDS or against the wall or boycott uh, of Israeli goods, uh, etc. That's There's one language there. There's another language of uh, cultural language of what it means to be Palestinian under these circumstances uh, that you see developing <coughs> Uh, there um, in various initiatives to establish uh, various Palestinian cultural organizations. Uh, there's the NGO language uh, that is trying to gain traction through human rights and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, um, 
uh, these languages are colliding. They're not necessarily coming together and, and becoming a new uh, recognized vocabulary for everybody to use. I think uh, this kind of fragmentation is enriching in one sense, that people are experimenting with different ways of doing politics, but at the same time, uh, they're not leading, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, to a common language that everybody's using and for themselves to understand what is it that they really want and to explain that to the world as well. There's a sense in which uh, people on the inside, that's to say inside of 1948 lines, uh, are feeling... Uh, as if they're living in the West Bank now, which is really strange. And the reason is that settlers from the West Bank are reconquering <laughs> Israel. They're going into Arab communities in Upper Nazareth, in Acre, in Jaffa, and Haifa. They're beating people up. They're burning mosques. They're uh, trying to um, reconsolidate or reconquer <clears throat> Uh, this area, make it more of a Jewish space. And they're feeling, for the first time, many of the things that people in the West Bank were... Going back to your point about the different languages that are being spoken by different parties and actors in different places, I want to think about what's going on externally uh, in terms of solidarity movements. Do any of those languages resonate better with international public opinion, for example, maybe progressive activists in the United States or, or other kinds of groups? And do you think that, that gives them a leg up uh, domestically over the long term? Yeah, there's no question that uh, the universal language uh, of human rights that's used by NGOs especially is designed in many ways, gets its strength from um, uh, this in international solidarity um, effort. Um, so um, I think that works very well uh, if you're thinking about Europe and the United States, if you're thinking about a Western-educated elites in those places. Uh, but the language of um, anti-imperialism or the language of, um, let's say, uh, political Islam also plays well, but in different places. Um, so uh, there are, in fact, not one single international context, but many different international languages and contexts, just like there are in the Palestinian, inside the Palestinians. So the different languages of politics are not just a result of a specific Palestinian situation. They are also a result of a changing world order in which the state is no longer the only, in, um, in which the state no longer monopolizes the language of politics. There's international and transnational movements uh, that have their say as well. Well, what, which of these do you think is the most interesting or offers the most for 2012? Because we see a rise of um, kind of, you know, politically moderate Islamist groups in the region. Uh, and maybe we also see progressive solidarity activism, especially from young, you know, Jewish Americans, for example, also um, increasing. I mean, do you have any thoughts about these differences and the prospects they hold? They don't necessarily... Uh conflict with each other, even though it seems that they do. But the fact that they play to different audiences, I think, is important. Um, so there's no doubt whatsoever that when it comes to mass movements in the region, the language of political Islam has entered a new phase, um, let's say a phase of uh, direct access to the structures of political power that used to exist before. In other words, the institutions of the state are falling into their hands more and more in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere. And that puts them in a situation where they can make things happen, not just on the ideological level, not just on the grassroots level, but also in terms of state actions. And uh, one of the reasons that Hamas is undergoing a vigorous internal debate now has to do uh, with, with, with this issue of how Hamas can position itself to be uh, in a successful political situation and gain le international legitimacy like the Islamist movement did in Egypt and, or, or in Tunisia. Uh, but when it comes to, um, um, let's say, the field of the United States or some parts of Europe, um, the language of um, human rights, of uh, so-called secular enlightenment kind of universal discourse, mm -hmm. 
uh, I think, plays better uh, to a lot of organizations and governments. It reminds them of the duplicity of their actions, of the hypocrisy of their positions. Uh, it, it, use, it references um, ideas that they say they believe in, but they don't necessarily practice when it comes to the Palestinians. So it opens up a space for Palestinian activists and their supporters to uh, have a say in the public sphere. Now, in an election year in the United States, uh, traditionally, you know, this kind of issue moves to the side and, and, and Israel is maybe given an opportunity to have more leeway to do what it wants to do. Um, I, it depends on what your view, I guess, of what the U.S.'s exact role is. But in election year, you can say that the U.S. foreign policy establishment usually is sort of frozen, more, th more so than usual. Um, do you think that that shifts the balance in terms of which of these languages could have more influence uh, in 2012? Well, hist historians don't like to think of 2012, 2013, maybe, maybe 20th, 20th century, 21st century. Uh, we have a little bit longer uh, time frame. Uh, when it comes to the United States, uh, I, I don't see the political establishment uh, as having any real influence. Uh, um, that somehow the barometer changes between the elections or during elections. I, I know that this is a Washington thing that, oh, uh, Israel may attack Iran because right now this is when they can get away with it, when Obama is, is uh, gearing up for election, can't criticize Israel and so on. But I, I think the fundamentals of the policy um, uh, are much more uh, important and much more long term. Uh, and I don't see any real change in the U.S. policy in, in, in this region um, in the near future, during, before, after elections. Did you have any other thoughts that you wanted to share with the audience? Well, uh, I think it's important to think that of the Palestinians uh, living in Palestine as only a part of the Palestinian people. So there's at least half or more Palestinians that are living outside of Palestine, and uh, they get they are forgotten often in conversations, and I think they have to be remembered as a really absolutely important part of the Palestinian body politic. The other thing I would say is uh, that this body politic itself is uh, uh, riveted with the class differences, not just regional differences, not just political differences. Um, if you take the situation in the West Bank, for example, there are people who, yes, we, they all depend on handouts in one way or the other uh, to survive, whether as civil servants uh, in the Palestinian Authority or as poor people who receive uh, on every month some kind of help with food, with uh, money, with uh, free health care, etc. Uh, but there, there are major differences between the two. Some, uh, the, it's, uh, it's amazing. How many cars, how many new buildings, how, how many, uh, that there's a burgeoning kind of exploding almost economy, but it seems the fruits of it are limited to a smaller and smaller group of people. And um, there's a great deal of poverty, and insecurity, anger uh, out there. And these class differences will have a major impact on whatever political um, um, movement we witness over the next year, they will be reflected in these, in these movements. Well, I want to thank you very much for being with us, Professor Dumeni. You're welcome. Thank you for talking with me.